gracias. Hi, uh, I'm Chris Stewart. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to do this in English today because my Spanish sucks. So it's probably best if you all understand me a little bit. Um, so we have a problem. The, ah, OK. So as he said, I work for Empirical Spirits. It's a distillery in Copenhagen. Um, we do things slightly differently to a lot of distilleries. Uh, our main objective is to put flavor first um, at all cost um, from every step through out distillation from grain to bottle. Um, throughout my talk today, I'm going to talk in, I'm going to split into like three sections. So the first section is going to be predominantly around the production, uh, how we make our spirits, and just the inner workings of the distillery. The middle portion is going to be a little tasting because it's lunchtime and everyone needs to drink booze at lunchtime. Uh, and the last part, I'm going to go into uh, taking like a case study of a product that's going to be released in around a month or two uh, and talk more about the creative process of that to kind of explain how we arrive at a lot of things we do. Um, so if I'm boring, I'm sorry. If you have any questions, just shout away. Uh, so this is our small little distillery. Uh, it's changed a lot over the last few years. This is our, this is our brew house. If you think of spirits, a lot of spirits begin with um, a lot of spirits begin with, uh, with your base, whatever you're brewing. So uh, a lot of distilleries will buy in neutral green spirit, add flavoring and redistill it, such as gins and stuff. We don't do that. We believe that your base ingredient actually carries over a lot of flavor. So we have to start from the beginning. Um, being in Northern Europe, uh, a lot of what we brew of is barley. But we don't just use barley. So this actually in the hand, it's uh, pearled barley. So it's barley that has been polished back. The reason we use pearled barley for part of our production is it's used for our koji. Uh, we make koji in-house uh, here. So koji is a mold uh, that's used a lot in Asia, uh, primarily Japan. It's used for many different uh, resources, but primarily in the alcohol side of things. It's uh, used for the sacrification of grains, such in sake, in uh, shoshu. It's also used to make miso, soy sauce, many different things. Um, but we use it primarily for the sacrification of grains as we're making booze. So a lot of our base spirits are a hybrid between Eastern and Western techniques. So if you see here, uh, this is actually an old butter churner that we bought from a, from a dairy in uh, Western Uland, which is the main part of Denmark, like the big part. Um, and so our grains are steamed in there. We use pearl barley, as I said, in, uh, in Japan. For most sakis and shoyu, they would use, for shoshu, they would use um, pearled rice. Um, so it's steamed there, and then it drops down to the room below, uh, which you can see. So this room that we've built is temperature and humidity controlled. So it stays at around 37 degrees uh, and around 70% humidity. As the grains drop down, they're, uh, they're come into the room, they're brought to temp, and then they're inoculated with the mold spores, uh, which is called koji kin, um, which is what's called in Japanese. And, Kin means like seed, basically. Um, so by doing this here, we inoculate the type of mold that we use is Asperilogus oarzi. There's a lot of different molds within the Koji realm that have a lot of different functions. We use Asperilogus oarzi because it's um, for its, uh, its application process. It's better for the application of alcohol. Um, boop. So you can see it's, it's almost like a sauna. It's lined with wood. It's, basically. This is the finished product. Uh, so this is after the mold has grown. It takes around 48 hours. This is what we add then to our brew, uh, along with Pilsner malt. And then you get, this, is the, this will be the base brew for one of our spirits. Um, so this will have, we call this a koji cake. Uh, this will have a look. Yeah? Yeah, no problem. Uh, so the reason we use koji is to, uh, for the suffocation of grains. This koji here is not just to break down sugars to produce amylase. It's also that it has a beautiful mushroomy flavor. It has this like very sweet floral notes. Um, so it has a lot of added potential in a base brew. Well, yeah. utilizan una levadura que se llama jo koji. Eh, básicamente, el grano que utilizan es la cebada, pero para hacer la fermentación utilizan la levadura que se llama koji, que tiene un aroma muy a setas y Y bueno, básicamente es la parte más técnica, lo que han dicho ahora. So, back to brewing. Um, 
this is just a photo of our brew. We actually brew a lot of different base, um, like our base wash. So depending on what spirit we're going to make, we will have a different uh, wash. So as I spoke about koji, that predominantly is a 40% koji mash bill to 60% malted barley. Um, we also do a, which you will taste today, you'll taste that today, and then you'll also taste a malted barley and a purple wheat, uh, which is this. This is our head brewer, Yuki, hiding inside our mash tun because he needed to clean it. And I thought it was a funny photo, so there's a photo of Yuki. Uh, so this is actually molasses that's been brewed. Um, coming back to looking at different ways and different base, uh, base washes, uh, I'm a huge fan of like sugarcane, molasses, and anything in that kind of realm. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of beet sugar that is made in Northern Europe. Uh, you get a lot of beet molasses. A lot of it's completely fucking shit. Um, and when you have to use this, a lot of spirits that are made from it taste like ass, and it's terrible. So we found a mol molasses purveyor who was getting 90% pure molasses. And then we worked with a lot of different yeasts. I got different yeast strains isolated from different places in the Caribbean that were suitable for molasses and different things. And it ended up being best suitable with uh, a Belgian Cezanne yeast. Uh, and it has this like, beautiful, light, cheesy note to it. Um, kind of then has the grassy note that you would get from like, molasses in general. Um, and it doesn't taste like ass as most sugar beets do. Bueno, que um, utiliza también trigo morado, cebada, y le interesa mucho utilizar también la melaza como producto. Lo utiliza de la remolacha, pero la, remola, la, la remolaza de la remolacha da un sabor muy malo. Y entonces él prefiere utilizar una, ha probado diferentes levaduras, algunas del Caribe, pero se queda con una de, de Bélgica, que le da un toque a queso y también a hierba. Um, so, as a brewery, you end up with a lot of spent grain because you need roughly, it's like one kilo of grain to about two and a half kilos of water, depending on what you're brewing, what you're doing. So you have a lot of uh, leftover produce. So this here is actually me. Um, and out of our spent grains, we try to put them back into use. So we start to make shoyu, uh, which is like soy sauce in Japan. And then we also make misos out of it. So because there's still a lot of active enzymes left in your koji that was in our brews, so we can if we create the right conditions, we can then use this, which is basically a byproduct from, um, from breweries to create just new products. Um, so it cuts down a lot of our waste. Here we are as it starts to ferment. Sí, eh, com, como la, el koji después de utilizarlo para lo que necesitan ellos todavía está muy activo desde el punto de vista enzimático, lo utilizan para hacer shoyu y también para hacer miso y se lo considera pues, un subproducto de la destilería. Yeah. Uh, so this is when it started fermenting. Uh, it's going to take between three to six months to ferment. Uh, for shoyu, miso, then it's six months to a year, depending on what it is. This is my favorite pato. Um, so whatever spent grain we can't use, we send to a chicken farm. Um, and the chicken farm also grows some they have like a polytone, they grow some botanicals that we can also play with and stuff. But this fucking duck is angry as hell. Every time I go there to check up on stuff, it gets really annoyed at me. And it like just gets aggressive. And it's, it's the worst thing in the world. I had to put a picture of it in. So I hate that duck. Uh, this is just taking samples of the shoyu. Uh, as it progresses on, it goes from being like quite a sour grain. I don't know if you've ever tasted grain that's went sour. It doesn't have a very good flavor from changing into that to being quite sweet to then having a very, like, because uh, the Maillard reaction takes place, so you have this beautiful roasty kind of flavor comes through, which a lot of size has flavor for. This is our distillery room. Um, this photo was actually taken about six months ago. Um, so we actually have three more stills than we did here. Um, but just a little side note on what we do. So you might look that it kind of looks like a mess a little bit, but it's not. It does make sense. Um, so we don't distill in a traditional pot still. We don't apply heat. Uh, everything is distilled under a vacuum. So instead of applying heat to bring it to its boiling point, we apply vacuum, lowering the atmospheric pressure so that we can then distill at like our, our, um, our stripping run is around 30 degrees, and our spirit runs are around 12 to 15 degrees. 
instead of the boiling point of alcohol, which is 78.3. So by doing this, we don't burn off a lot of flavors that are created by the yeast, by the koji, by different botanicals. We can preserve them and capture them. Eh, si no utilizan eh, ningún proceso de, de calor, eh, lo consiguen los destilados a, a través del vacío. Por lo tanto, la temperatura nunca supera los 20 o los 30 grados en lugar de los 70 grados que serían un proceso tradicional en el que se hierve el, el destilado y por lo tanto pierde muchísimos aromas. Y lo que quieren ellos es hacerlo en, en, en frío para que no pierda estos aromas. Gracias. Um, so just to kind of elaborate a little bit, because I know this picture looks like a mess, but it's the best picture we have. Uh, this is the still. This is a still, this is a still. So this is like the pot, which would be like in a traditional pot still. This is your column. Then we have our condensers. But instead of having heat to it, uh, from here, yeah, you can see it here. This comes off, and it's, it's attached to a vacuum pump. So we're distilling at around six tars, which equates to around 12 millibar which is roughly about one bar below atmospheric pressure. Um, that's distilling. So as we take our cuts, everything is cold distillation. Um, so we don't apply any heat, which we believe can actually hold in a lot of that flavor and preserve those finer notes. Um, you can be the judge when you taste things in about five minutes. Uh, this is me again. You can see my bald spot. I started balding in the last couple of years. I'm super proud of it. I'm at that moment. There's like, I believe like balding is like a death. You have like the five stages. I'm past denial, now I'm in the acceptance, it's okay. Uh, it's just a rotovap, as you can see here. So this rotovap was where we originally there, started, um, started distilling all of our, so in our products, instead of rectifying with water, we use kombucha and vinegar a lot that are distilled. Que para hacer con el, con el rotovap lo que utilizan es eh, kombucha en vez de utilizar agua. Y bueno, ha enseñado el proceso de, de destilado en frío en el que se ven los tanques de acero, los condensadores, las columnas y la bomba de vacío sin aplicar el calor. Um, so we originally started doing it in rotovaps because they don't contain any copper, because acetic acid in vinegars and kombucha will just destroy copper, it'll eat away at it. Um, so we've now built purpose based stills to. To, um, to distill vinegars and kombuchas, but by doing this, instead of just adding water, which is a neutral flavor, you can, if you distill a kombucha, you get several different cuts, the same as you would in a, in a, in a, in a spirit run, except you get a lot of acetic acid coming through at the end, you get a lot of kind of light flavors that are water soluble in the beginning, so you get a lot of different flavors from a botanical that isn't achievable through distillation spirits without doing a hydrosol. Sí. Eh, que en vez de utilizar agua utilizan kombucha o vinagre que lo que hace es aportar aromas ligeros al, al destilado. Mm. Um, we do a lot of cuts. We break our spirits down into several different cuts of several different runs and we blend afterwards. Uh, a lot of bigger distilleries will just do like five cuts. Um, but we feel you miss something so we kind of do a more rudimental version which is kind of what historically you would have done, which is breaking it down into very small portions and then blending afterwards. Um, now we're going to do a tasting. Yes. <laughs> now for the booze. She's happy. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're going to taste a couple of products. We're going to taste two products now. Um, so just to, to give a little background on these two products, we have our evergreen products, which are kind of like our core range, which is available for um, like up to a year, maybe a little bit longer. But then we have like one-off products, which is available. We release a new one-off every month. So they're kind of smaller, more seasonal, and so, what, and so on and so forth. Whereas these products are available continuously. So bars, restaurants, and stuff can put them on menus and can deal with them. Uh, so this first product is called the Plum, I suppose. Um, it's based off the wash that I spoke about earlier, which is koji and uh, Belgian saison yeast with, with malted barley. Um, but it's a hybrid of two distillations. So it's a spirit distillation and then a kombucha distillation. Um, so it's based off plum kernels, which is the stones that's in plums. And then also it's marigold flowers, which is the petals from a marigold. Um, two separate, mastered into spirit and distilled separately. And then there's also, um, 
the marigold flowers are made into a kombucha, which is also distilled separately, which is then added in, which is why you get like a light acidity on the finish. You get that kind of uh, crisp, almost tannicness, which you would find in the skin of a plum, but that actually only comes from the marigold flowers. And that beautiful uh, marzipani kind of nose comes from the marigold stones. Uh, Está diciendo que utiliza los huesos de las ciruelas. Es un proceso de dos destilados. Utiliza los huesos de las ciruelas y luego caléndula. So, next product. I think so. You like it? Yeah, this is Castilla. Oh, is it? Thank you. Okay. So, what you're tasting is the opposite way around. Um, I didn't know it was going to come out this way. My apologies. So, I just explained what you're going to taste. Now I'm going to explain what you are tasting. Thank you, sir, for saying that. I appreciate it. You're from Oaxaca. Of course you know it. <laughs> so uh, now I'm going to talk about Pasilla, which is a chili from Oaxaca, which this gentleman could probably tell you a lot more about than I can. Um, but yeah, Pasilla is a beautiful chili that, um, that comes from Oaxaca. Uh, in southern Mexico. Um, so it's grown at a very high altitude. Um, and the way it's dried, it's dried through smoking it. So you get this beautiful earthy smoke. And you also get this ruby red flavor of a chili. Um, and it's, it only exists in this one area in Mexico. And it's like just a beautiful expre expression of, for me, Mexican cuisine. Uh, and also just like the attention to detail on food and booze and everything. Um, and actually, how we ended up doing this, yeah. Eh, este segundo producto que estáis probando utiliza el chile, un chile que obtienen de Oaxaca, de México, que se cultiva a, gran, a una altitud muy elevada y entonces le aporta un sabor, bueno, un aroma eh, ahumado porque se seca con un proceso de ahumado y luego tiene el aroma de rojo chile, eh, típico de los chiles. Um, so, how this actually happened, we did a, the yuk was originally, we did a test batch of it, which is a one off, which is called Rebecca Buendía. Uh, it's a character from a book. Um, but so Lars, one of the co-founders of the, co of the company, went to Oaxaca, was in a market, found someone selling pasilla, bought all the pasilla that guy had, put it in a suitcase, flew back to Copenhagen, arrived to me in the morning and went, here's a suitcase. And I was like, this is a bit weird. Opened it up, found this amazing, delicious chili. We made a spirit out of it. And yeah, then we realized that, fuck, this tastes amazing. We have to do more. So then we went back to, I didn't, Lars did. Lars went back to Oaxaca, went and met with the farmers and was like, okay, so we got uh, like a cooperative, like a group of farmers to come together and we basically buy their crop from them as they finish. So we don't deal with any importers, exporters, any middlemen. We deal directly with the farmer and try and get them like a fairer price. And so we just meet their demands. Um, and we're also trying to bring in like to an education of how to grow things differently uh, and just trying to support as we can. It's a super cool uh, like group of people, group of farmers, what they're doing is amazing. En estos, bueno, primero hicieron un lote de prueba, entonces fueron a, a un mercado allí en, en Oaxaca, compraron, bueno, llenaron una maleta de diferentes productos, probaron el chile este que es lo que más les gustó y volvieron y decidieron hacer, aparte del lote de prueba, pues utilizarlo de forma permanente. Entonces hay una, colaboran con una cooperativa de agricultores que cultivan este producto y lo que sin intermediarios y lo que intentan es ofrecerles un precio justo por el produ por el producto que les ofrecen. Um, so the product that I explained before this is the one that's going to come out now. So enjoy. My apologies for them coming out the opposite way around. Uh, so this is actually the chili. It's stunningly beautiful. It's an amazing flavor. If you ever get the chance to go to Oaxaca find someone who has this chili and talk to them about it, or just come to us and talk to us about it. We have loads lying around all the time. So it's pretty cool. Whoop. This is, so after now I said I would do like a case study on uh, the kind of more creative process and our one-offs and stuff. As I said that Lars came back with a suitcase from Oaxaca and just was like, here you go. This happens more often than you would like to think. Uh, so, I'm going to use a case study of one product, which was a product which is based off uh, mandioca, or manioca, or cassava, whatever you want to call it. Manioca. Mandioca. Yeah, OK, sorry. <laughs> Just joking. Um, so it's, yeah, so after a trip to Brazil, we were going to collaborate on a product with uh, Alex Atala and Atta. Um, and so Lars went to Brazil, brought back a shit ton of suitcases, 
Um, what happens is usually he brings a lot of shit back. This is my old desk. It's not my desk anymore. And we have to test things. We taste things. We figure out the application of it. And then it might become something. So usually there's a shit ton of things come in. We whittle it down, and we try and figure out what it is. So from this, I'm going to use one event to kind of describe the, the process. So this time last year, so one year ago, uh, Lars had been in Brazil, and he arrived back with this suitcase with some type of a plant that I don't remember, which I have no fucking idea how he got through airport security. Um, and a load of other products, beautiful fruits, the most like, amazing things, different woods from the Amazon, like just amazing amount of flavors that like, as someone who grew up in Ireland, like, was just blown away by, and I was like, fuck, okay, this is great. But the one thing that for me was like, incredible was mandioca, which um, you don't really get in like, a lot of Europe. It doesn't really exist. Um, but in Brazil, it's like a staple. It's like how we eat potatoes in Ireland, they eat mandioca. It's, you know, it's everyone has their carb. Um, but it has this, when it's like freshly cooked, it has the most beautiful flavor, which is like very hard to replicate. So I wanted to make like a white dog out of it. So like a, a spirit that would be an expression of that, which would capture all the parts of it. So we, I started growing, trying to inoculate it with koji. Uh, with Espirito Suarez's spores. We tried different spores, this took the best. It's not the best environment to try and grow a mold on, um, but it will. You can figure it out, it just took a long time. So I eventually figured out how it would grow. Uh, I started fermenting it, uh, fermented it, different yeasts. Uh, tried several different yeasts from different areas of the world to see which would take to the certain sugars that were available in it. Tried loads of different methods of fermenting it. And eventually, we got one bottle of Spirit, which was tasted good. Um, it tastes like that beautiful smell of fresh mandioca. And so then we went back to the drawing board and was like, OK, we can make one bottle. How do we make you know, a couple of thousand bottles? It's... So we started trying to make better koji so we could break down the sugars in the, the available starches that was in the in the mandioca to ferment it, so then we could actually make alcohol, which turns out to be super difficult because it's pretty much just pure starch, um, which is like tapioca. So this was like one trial. Then another trial went a little better. Another trial went like kind of shit, I'm not going to lie. Um, here's a trial that looked like a pancake. It didn't work at all. It was a disaster. Um, and then eventually it did work, which is back to this one. This is where it actually worked, where you can see like a lot of like really nice mold growth. You can see that it has actually penetrated into the into the mandioca and it's starting to work. Um, so by doing this here and then adding it to the raw juice, we can create a mash bill that it will ferment. So by using the amylase that we've created in the in the koji, we can break down the juice and the starches in the juice. So then we can actually make alcohol. Uh, so we're doing this without using any enzymes, which a lot of brews and stuff that you get from mandioca, they just add a shit ton of enzymes to break it down, which is the easy way out. But who likes the easy way when you can take the hard way? And so going back, so yeah. Whoop. So then we did like a lot of different ways of distillation. We tried a shit ton of different yeasts um, and different, different, uh, different mash bills, different yeasts, different forms of fermentation. And we tested all of them, tasted all of them, and we found that a sake yeast from Japan um, actually complemented uh, the flavors, the light floralness that you find within mandioca. Um, so you have like the beautiful koji flavor, the rich, like fresh, freshly cooked mandioca flavor, and then you have the nice floral aspect from a sake yeast. And then the one thing that was missing was like that very, that one last Brazilian little thing to tie it all together. Um, and I got a sample of wood from uh, Ambarana, which is an indigenous hardwood to the Amazon, which is incredible. It's like super, it's used in perfume a lot. And so I got that. It worked really well with the spirit. And then we contacted um, a cooper in Brazil and was like, hey, can you make a cask out of this? And he didn't think we were serious. It took him like three months to get back. And then he was like, yeah, I can. I was like, OK. And he was like, aren't you in Copenhagen? And we were like, yes, I'm in Copenhagen. And I'm not lying. I want that cask. So he sent me two little small casks like this, which are little babies, uh, which are useless. And then he sent me one big cask, 
which is uh, about this size, 100 liters. Um, and it imparts this beautiful, kind of very perfume finish, um, similar to like Palmaroso or things of that kind of nature, it would be. And so, yeah, it went into a cask, it came out, and it worked. We went from, so it took, this bottle was, it's only been released about in a month's time. I took this photo uh, just at my desk about two, three weeks ago. Um, so from me receiving the Manjoka from like a back and forth between me and Lars, it took in total one year to figure out how to make Manjoka taste like Manjoka in a spirit, which you kind of think spending one full year failing, 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 failing that you want to just fucking kill yourself because it sucks. But then eventually you get a bottle that's like this and it's amazing. Um, uh, these were ones that we sent to Brazil. So this is done in collaboration with Alex Tala. And uh, it will be available like in our web store and stuff. So please check it out. Um, if not for want of taste, just for the fact that I spent a year of my life trying to figure it out. So thank you. Gracias por todos. <laughs> <laughs>